Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Lizard folk eight. Be me, Lizard DM. Be not me, Lizard folk fighter, Lizard folk cleric, Lizard folk sorcerer, Lizard folk paladin. Drow Rogue. Party, having gotten the rogue back, are preparing to leave the city of Talodi. As soon as he steps out into the sun, the rogue holds up his hands to his eyes. It always this bright? The lizard folk look at him. Cleric, not bright. The rogue shakes his head. Like hell it isn't. I can hardly see. The paladin thinks for a moment. Come with me, we'll go see what we can do about that. They travel into town, gathering lots of odd looks as they move. They finally enter a store, a series of gears on a sign out front. A gnome with a robot on looks up from his work behind a desk. How can I help you? Yeah. The paladin gestures to the rogue. He can't see in the sun. Can you do anything about that? The gnome walks over. Can you kneel down bud? The rogue complies, but he still doesn't take off his hood. The gnome sighs. Take off the hood too mate. The rogue reluctantly pulls back the hood, showing his drow features. The gnome crosses his arms and frowns. A drowy? What are you doing out of the underdark, mate? Lose your faith in all that spooky spider shit? The paladin taps the gnome with his tail. Can you help us or not? The gnome pauses and thinks. I reckon I've got something for it. He goes back behind the counter and they can hear him pulling open several drawers. Finally, he reappears, holding what looks like a large pair of clockwork goggles. These are night vision goggles. I made them so that they automatically filter out sudden bright light. With a bit of tinkering, I can make them day vision goggles though. The paladin nods. How long will that take and how much will it set us back? The gnome shrugs. A few hours and around 50 gold. The paladin winces and looks at the rogue. The rogue shrugs. I can pay. The paladin nods. The gnome steps forward, now with a measuring tape. Gonna take a measurement of your head. Look weird if it's too wide. The rogue reluctantly lets the gnome put a measuring tape around his head. The gnome writes down the radius on a sketch pad and nods. Come back in a four hours. Should be done. The two leave going out to get a bit of food before coming back 4 hours later. The gnome presents the rogue with the goggles, which now have a weird, extra dial on the side. The gnome points to it. Twist that dial, and it filters between normal and day vision. During the day, slide it down, and it'll place a filter over your eyes. Slide it up and the filter goes away. The rogue pays and thanks him, sliding the goggles on. They look odd. But as he steps outside, they appear to work. They meet up with the rest of the party and finally depart from the city. They travel for about 6 days, passing deep forests and several towns. On the 7th day, they finally reach the William and Mountain Range, the range that acts as the divider between North and South Isopin. As they stop for a small break during the day, the fighter sits down next to the rogue. He grabs the goggles and puts them over his head straining a bit due to the size difference. The rogue protests, but the fighter holds him back with his foot. Having forcefully slid the goggles on, he glances around, looking incredibly odd as he does so. Look all dark. The rogue tries to snatch it back. Well, it's better than not being able to see it also give it back. He eventually grabs it back, and shortly after they head back off, the fighter having sated his curiosity for the time being. They travel for another few hours, now under the immense shadow of mountains that stretch far above their heads. They occasionally see small caves in the walls, but after inspecting one and being spooked by growls inside, the party decide it's better to avoid them. However, as they are walking along, they see a cave further down the rocks, on the surface of the ground. They would have walked past it if the rogue hadn't gotten curious. He walked over and flipping the filter of his goggles off, saw what lay inside. He lets out a yelp and stumbles back. The party run over, weapons in hand. He points inside. 
they look inside but don't see anything. He casts light, and the party's eyes widen as they notice a staircase in the floor, several skeletons crawling away from it, as if they had died trying to escape. The sorcerer points to it. That no good. The party nod. The paladin takes a moment before he shakes his head. No undead in there. They nod and creep forward, their curiosity beating back their common sense. As they sneak forward, the rogue slides the goggles off his head, putting them in his backpack. He looks at one of the skeletons, but can't figure out what they may have died from. However, as he stands near the top of the stairs he pulls his cloak tighter around him. Freezing air lingers around the entrance. He points at each member of the party individually and casts message. Shit's freezing down there. That can't be good. Cleric, will be fine. The cleric goes to step past him, but the rogue holds his hand out, stopping him. I've got some intense dark vision right now, so maybe it's best if I go first. The party agree. He starts to descend down the steps, moving around the skeletons. Goosebumps appear on his skin as he goes lower, and his lips begin to turn blue. It's freezing. The stairs descend for a long time, heading deeper into the ground. The rogue passes a pebble back to the cleric and casts light on it, changing the color to red so as to avoid casting too much shine. The cleric grabs the pebble and passes it back along the line, making his own. Soon, the party is bathed in dim red light. The rogue creeps almost silently down the steps until finally, it comes to a corner. He pokes his head around, using his superior dark vision to peer inside. His eyes widen as he takes in the sight before him. Before him is an immense room, looking somewhat like an underground chapel. At least 40 robed figures kneel on the stone before him, heads down and bodies pointed to the front. Looking at the front, he sees a large statue, depicting a creature he can't wrap his head around. He pokes his head back around and points at the cleric. Some sort of church down here. At least 40 or so people. Not moving. The cleric nods and passes the message back along essentially playing Chinese whispers. The fighter, who is at the back, frowns. What mean hairy fleshy? The rogue glares at him and raises a finger to his lip. He peers around the corner, but no one has moved. He points at the sorcerer. Make me invisible, I wanna have a look. The sorcerer nods and taps him. The rogue, now invisible, creeps quietly into the room. He sneaks down a line of people getting closer and closer to the altar. He freezes in place when he hears a series of loud creaks. Turning slowly, he looks around him. He barely holds back a whimper as he sees 40 skeletal faces turned towards him, bodies still in their kneeling positions. They don't do anything but stare at him. He draws the dagger and carefully leans over to a kneeling skeleton, poking its head with the dagger. The skull gets a small indent from the dagger point, but the skeleton doesn't react. He turns towards the statue, trying to ignore the silent stares. As he tries to inspect it, he realizes just how wrong it looks. The body is twisted and mangled, the head an unrecognizable mess. Its arms are freakishly long, and its fingers, if you could even call them that, bend in odd directions. He feels a shiver run down his body, and as he stands there, his invisibility bleeds away. He shakes his head and walks back to the party. Freaky shit in there. The paladin frowns. What's in there? The rogue shrugs. Weird statue. Creepy kneeling skeletons that turn to look at you. They could see me even though I was invisible. The party walk around the corner, entering the horrific church. With a horrible cracking, the heads of the skeletons snap around to stare at them. The rogue lets out a little OFCK that. The cleric, not bothered by the display, walks forward, poking one of the skeletons with his finger. It doesn't react. The paladin kneels down and grabs one's head. Why didn't I sense them? The sorcerer looks around the room and joins the fighter standing beside the statue. The sorcerer looks at the base, where he can see a small stone bowl. At the bottom of the bowl is money, treasures and disturbingly, a skeletal hand. As he looks closer, the sorcerer notices that the hand appears to be gripping something. He leans down and picks it up, bending back one of the fingers. Inside, he sees a small amulet. He goes to grab it, 
and the hand grabs his, closing tightly. He yelps draws his dagger, trying to pry away at them. He grabs one of the fingers and snaps it off, and suddenly, the hand loses all tension, falling to the stone floor with a crack. The paladin walks over, looking at the amulet. I wouldn't put that on if I were you. The sorcerer nods and stuffs it into his bag. The fighter meanwhile, is inspecting the statue. He walks around it, inspecting it with the same look someone gives a piece of artwork. After making a full 360, he stands looking at the head. Then, without any warning, he reaches out and places his hand against it. His body goes stiff immediately, and the party let out yells of shock as he falls to the ground and begins seizing. I ask everyone to leave the room. The fighter feels a cold chill as he opens his eyes. Everything around him is black. He rises to his feet and looks around this abyss. The only thing he can see is the statue. As he looks at it, the statue begins to move, stretching out those long arms and turning its mangled head to face him. He draws midnight and growls, but the figure doesn't seem to care. It steps off its podium, shambling towards him on uneven feet. He goes to step back, but finds that, despite how much he tries to move, he doesn't seem to get any further away. The statue crawls forward, extending its long arms towards him. He swings midnight, but the black blade fades from his hands in a spiraling mist. The hands close around the sides of his head and the figure moves forward, looking into his eyes with pits of an unending void. As he looks inside, he feels his body go numb and he begins to hear the faintest sound of whispers in his head that finally form into a single word. Mine. The cleric runs over to the spasming fighter and places his hand on him, casting cure wounds. The fighter goes still, his eyes wide open and unseeing. They originally think he's dead, but they can still see his chest rising and falling. Rogue, grab him and let's get the FCK out of here. The paladin scoops him up and they run out of the cave. The sun is getting low, so the rogue doesn't bother placing his goggles back on. As soon as they leave the cave, the fighter's eyes flutter, as if being in the presence of that statue had been leaving him comatose. The paladin places him on the ground and the party gather around him. He sits up, holding his head. Why outside? The rogue shakes his head. Because you touched a statue and fell to the floor. What the FCK was that about? The fighter shakes his head. Statue come alive. The paladin shakes his head. It didn't move. You dropped to the ground and just started spasming. The fighter turns to him. Statue come alive. The party move further away and camp for the night. The fighter sits beside the fire, staring into its depths, a blank expression on his face. The rogue walks over to the paladin. I'm worried about him. The paladin nods. I don't know what he saw, and honestly, I don't want to. The rogue nods. The cleric. On the other side of the campfire, grabs a leaf and places it into his mouth, staring at the fighter. The campfire dims briefly in the two meat eyes. The cleric's eyes widen as he sees a form behind the fighter, tall and twisted, distorted fingers grasping onto his shoulders. He blinks, and just as quickly as it appeared, the figure disappears. The cleric grabs a stone from the ground and begins fiddling with it, apparently deep in thought. The sorcerer pulls the amulet out of his bag, looking at it. In the center of the amulet is an opal, about the size and shape of an eye. He frowns as he sees something move inside it. He peers closer, looking into its depths. His eyes go glassy as he watches figures dance inside the opal, moving about. Nobody notices as he places it back in his bag and retreats into his tent. Game ends. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Be me, Lizard DM.
Be not me. Lizard folk fighter. Lizard folk cleric. Lizard folk sorcerer. Lizard folk paladin. Drow rogue. The party wake in the morning, stretching their limbs and preparing breakfast. The rogue winces as the light hits him, so he slides on his goggles and flicks on the filter. They climb into the cart and begin heading off again. The cleric never stops staring at the fighter and never turns his back for longer than a second. The fighter however, doesn't seem to notice, and is looking around at the mountains around them. As they move, the party is pretty quiet, not talking a lot. Until the cleric leans over to the paladin. The paladin leans in and the cleric puts his mouth to his ear, keeping one eye trained on the fighter. Sore thing knight. Hold, fighter, shoulder. The paladin frowns. Describe it. The cleric shrugs. Look like statue. There, but then not there. The paladin nods slowly and looks over at the fighter, who still isn't paying them any attention. The paladin looks over at the rogue and taps his head. The rogue nods and casts message. What's up? Cleric, saw something holding. Fighter, last night. I don't think we left that cave alone. The rogue flicks his eyes over to him but otherwise tries to pretend they aren't conversing telepathically. You reckon he's got a passenger? Yeah. Well, what are we going to do about it? The paladin frowns. We might be able to banish it, but not until we know what it is. If we act against him and it doesn't work, we're in trouble. The rogue nods subtly and leans back, using mage hand to pick up a rock from the ground beneath them. They travel until sundown, and after setting up their camp, the party lays around for a bit. The rogue, having taken off his goggles looks around their camp, keeping an eye out for any threats. They're camped in a shallow cave, more of an indent in the mountain than anything, so he only has one side to watch for. He sits at the mouth of the cave, looking out at the barely visible moon. As the others fall asleep, he leans against the wall, scratching a depiction of Corley's face into the dirt with a dagger. He's so busy with this that he at first doesn't notice the odd sounds. He's only keyed into it when one noise comes louder than the others. He looks up, perking his ears. After a moment, he identifies the noise, and he slowly raises his dagger. Shuffling. He looks back at the others and his blood runs cold. A figure is standing beside his sleeping friends, peering down at them. He creeps forward, sticking to the shadows and watching them. They kneel down, and after a moment, he sees them reach into folds of their flowing cloak. They pull out a small bag and as he watches, they reach into the bag and begin sprinkling something over his friends' faces. The rogue creeps closer and now barely 3 meters away, he silently draws his short sword, holding it in one hand and a dagger in the other. Silently, he casts mage hand and picks up a tiny rock in the corner. He slams it against the other cave wall. The person turns, and the rogue jumps out, weapons bared. The figure tries to turn around in time, but they're too late, and the rogue jumps them, pushing them to the ground and drawing their hood, dagger held to their throat and sword raised. He freezes as he looks at the figure's features. Long white hair, dark skin, pointed ears. A female drow. She flicks her eyes down to the dagger and flicks them back to him. She raises her hand slowly and moves the dagger slowly away from her throat. Get off of me she whispers in undercommon. What are you doing? He whispers back, also in undercommon. Claiming these ones for loth, now get off of me or I swear, you'll never breathe again. The rogue frowns. I'm the one with the dagger. She narrows her eyes. You dare threaten me? He nods. Yeah. I've got the dagger and you're kind of pinned right now. She glares at him. Lesser being, get off. I ain't no lesser being you bitch. He slides off of her, keeping the weapons close to her. She slowly gets to her feet. He nods to the cave entrance. Now get out of here before I think about waking the others. She frowns and gestures to them. You're with them? He doesn't answer. You live on the surface? He nods his head to the sword. You're in no position to ask questions of me. She smirks. They won't wake up. He shrugs. You sure about that? He uses mage hand and smacks the paladin on the head. The paladin rolls over but doesn't wake. He smacks the paladin again, but he still doesn't wake. What did you do to th- 
His words are cut off as she pushes the blades aside and punches him in the stomach. As he doubles over, she draws the dagger and goes to bring it down on him. He barely manages to deflect it with his own. He swings the short sword but she ducks underneath it with ease, blocking the second swipe. As their blades connect, the sword releases a clap of thunder, stunning her briefly. He uses the opportunity to slash her thigh with his dagger. She closes the distance between them and grabs his wrist, twisting it sharply, causing him to drop the short sword. With her other hand, she stabs him under his ribs. He grabs her by the hair and tries to stab her, but she grabs his wrist with her spare hand. She stabs him several times in the stomach and he's forced to let go of her hair. He backs up and holds out his hand, and a fireball erupts from it. Taken by surprise, she doesn't have any time to react before she's blasted in the chest. She ducks under his next swipe and sweeps his legs out from underneath him, sending both of them to the ground. She climbs on top but he grabs her and yanks her to the side. She punches him in the face and rolls back on top, pinning one arm with her knee and the other with a hand. He casts Unseen Servant and her eyes widen as it grabs the back of her cloak. She whirls around, slashing at it and he takes the opportunity to break free. They get up almost simultaneously, both breathing heavily and bleeding from stab wounds. You're better than I expected. Not as good as me but still capable. The rogue shrugs. Well I haven't had as much time to practice as you. I'm not used to these proportions. She frowns and goes to ask something, but he runs forward, casting Tensor's floating disc as he goes. Her eyes widen as he jumps onto the disc and leaps over her head, landing behind her and scooping up his short sword. She whirls around and throws her dagger, which he barely dodges. He looks back at her and smirks. You just lost your weapon. That was pretty dumb of you. She reaches for her shoulder and with a long scraping sound, draws a rapier. He frowns. How are you keeping that hidden? It's been a long time since I've had to use this. You seem to be worth it. It'll be a shame to waste someone like you. He holds up his hand briefly. UHH, I'm not sure what you're getting at, but I don't think I like it. He launches another firebolt, which he barely dodges. She stabs at him with the rapier and he barely deflects both strikes. He swings at her with the short sword, opening a cut on her arm. He tries to follow it up with a stab from the dagger but she smacks it aside. He gives a little wince as it cuts the sleeping cleric. She faints high with the rapier and as he goes to block it, she kicks him in the balls. He doubles over and groans. Oh, you're a bitch. As he looks up, he sees her pull something from her cloak. And before he can react, she blows a plume of dust into his face. His vision becomes hazy and he feels his knees buckle. She places a foot against his chest and slowly pushes him onto his back. She leans over, holding the rapier to his throat. You are a worthy opponent and under different circumstances you might have made a good mate. His eyes flutter and he feels his limbs go numb. You're insane. She glares at him and presses the rapier to his throat, drawing blood. Just before she slits his throat though, a dull thwack echoes through the cave. The rogue looks up as she falls to the ground, the cleric standing over her, an unlit torch in his hand. She groans so he leans down and hits her again, knocking her unconscious. He looks down at the rogue, even as his eyes finally close. The party wake up the next morning to find the cleric sitting cross-legged in front of a bound drow woman. The paladin walks over and gestures to her. Who's this? The cleric shrugs. Attack. Rogue. Almost kill but I stop. The drow says something to him and he just shakes his head. I don't understand you. She doesn't seem to care, spitting out several harsh sounding words at him. He shrugs. The sorcerer walks over, passing the cleric a piece of mystery meat. The cleric takes it gratefully and eats his breakfast. The rogue stumbles over, holding his head. He looks over at the drow woman, who glares at him. Don't glare at me. You cheated. She smirks. I wasn't aware that there were rules when it came to mortal combat. The rogue shrugs. True I suppose, but could you at least have one out of pure skill rather than cheap shots? She shrugs back. Perhaps, but why allow the potential to lose when you can ensure victory? The paladin nudges him. You can speak under common. The rogue shrugs. 
People don't like to trade with goblins. So we work with whoever will take us. He looks down at his body and frowns. Though I'm not exactly a goblin anymore, am I? The paladin shrugs. Your soul is your own. Bodies are temporary. The rogue nods. Yeah but now my body is far less temporary. How long do drow live anyway? The paladin shrugs. The rogue looks at the drow woman. How old would you say I look? She frowns. About 400 or so. Why? He nods and turns away, looking at the paladin with a holy shit sort of expression. What's wrong? The rogue pauses. She said I look 400. I was 14 as a goblin. The paladin shrugs. That sounds pretty young. The rogue shakes his head. I'm a full adult. If I have that long to live I'm going to live until I'm 800 or something. The paladin frowns and puts his hand to his chin. You'll outlive us by far. The rogue frowned. How long do you live? The paladin shrugs. I'm 19 now and I'm an adult. The rogue nods slowly. He points to the drow. So what do we do with her? The fighter walks over, hearing the question. Eat. The cleric shrugs next to him. No need bring. Chase if leave behind. The rogue looks at her and sees that she's gone pale. He smirks and kneels down. Listening in, ha. Huh. You can speak common, can't you? She glares at him and says nothing. He nods. Well, you heard the man. We don't have a use for you and leaving you behind will only cause trouble. The drow shakes her head. They won't eat me. The rogue laughs. You're kidding, right? I've seen the meat slard. They'd have no issue eating you. She raises an eyebrow. Well then you'd lose someone very useful. How can you be useful? You'll shank us as soon as we turn our backs. She shrugs. I know that isn't your true body. You are a goblin. Wouldn't you like to get that body back? The rogue pauses and the sorcerer kneels down beside him. You lie, fleshy. We eat. She looks at the rogue and raises an eyebrow. You going to let them eat me, goblin? He holds up his hand, stopping the sorcerer. The drow gives him a wide grin, confident that she's won. He leans in close. What's your name? She pauses. Jilin. He shrugs. I don't care if that's a lie. Jilin is the name I'll remember you by. She goes to open her mouth to say something and the rogue draws his sword, holding it to her throat. He gets really close. You're going to leave. You're going to crawl back into whatever hole you came from and you will never see us again. Remember that I'll let you live, that it is by my word that you can go back to your people. A lesser being chose your fate. You remember that. With that, he cuts her robes. He stands up, sword still pointed at her throat. She slowly stands up too. He nods to the exit of the cave and casting him a final glare, she begins to walk away. She holds a hand to her eyes as she exits before walking into the light. He turns away and faces the party. The fighter shakes his head. We'll come back. I know. The paladin frowns. Then why let her go? Because I'm not like her. He looks at the paladin. My soul stays the same, even if my body doesn't. The party head off pretty quickly, making sure Jilin doesn't have time to get reinforcements. They continue moving towards Desaria, moving along the bumpy paths in their cart. The sorcerer pulls out the amulet and looks at it while the others laze about in the sun. He suddenly jumps up, causing everyone to look at him. He drops the amulet and stares it, breathing heavily. The paladin looks up at him. What's wrong? The sorcerer points to the amulet and shakes his head. Not good. Not good. The rogue leans over and grabs the amulet looking into the opal eye. The color is slightly dull due to the filter over his eyes, and after looking at it for a while he shrugs. I don't see anything. The paladin leans over to the sorcerer and gets him to sit down. What did you see? The sorcerer pauses. We be too late. Go faster. The party stare at him. The paladin raises his hands. What do you mean? The sorcerer points at the amulet. Small fleshy get key. Go to Zaria. The rogue shakes his head. No, you said there were five keys. If they had them all, the forge god would already be active. The sorcerer shakes his head. 
Need find crown. Only need find crown. The party tent at his area, waiting expectedly for something they're not sure is coming. Game ends. Be me, Lizard DM. Be not me, Lizard Folk Fighter, Lizard Folk Cleric, Lizard Folk Sorcerer, Lizard Folk Paladin, Drow Rogue. Having received an ominous warning from the Sorcerer, who claims that the people responsible for lighting the Forge of Desiria have collected all of the five keys needed to release the Forge God, the party are in dire straits. The rogue taps his foot rapidly on the wooden planks of their cart. So if you know that they have the keys, do you know who they are? The sorcerer shakes his head and points to the amulet. Show picture. No sound. The paladin sighs. Okay then. Describe them. The sorcerer pauses for a moment. Small grey fleshy. Blood on armor. Black fur. The paladin frowns. Fur? The sorcerer points at the rogue's hair. Fur. The party think on this for a while. Cleric, how move faster? Paladin, I don't think, sorcerer can carry all of us. The rogue opens his mouth to speak when he hears the faintest sound. He holds up his hand, getting everyone to shut up for a moment. They all go silent and listen. The sound is weird. An odd rustling, whipping sound, seeming to get louder. The rogue pulls out his crossbow, looking around uneasily. The cleric lets out a yell of surprise as an arrow buries itself in the wood next to him. The rustling gets louder, before they hear a voice ring out. Surrender or die. They look up, just in time to see a figure land on the front of their cart. The rogue whirls to face them, crossbow raised. The person raises a glaive, holding it under his chin. Now that they've stopped moving, the party get a look at their features. Short stature, taloned hands, wings. An Arakakra. The voice rings out again, and the party realize it wasn't the Arakakra talking. Drop your weapons. They look up, seeing a blue skinned figure levitating high above them, longbow in their hands. The cart rocks as another two Arakakras land on the back and side of it, each holding another glaive. The blue skinned person releases an arrow which buries itself in the wood next to the paladin's leg. Drop your weapons. We don't want things to get ugly, now do we? The paladin looks over at the rogue, who is still having an intense stare down with the Arakakra holding the glaive to his throat. Rogue, drop it. The rogue looks over at him. The paladin points to the floor of the cart. After a reluctant pause, the rogue slowly places the crossbow on the ground. There is a chorus of knocks as the party drop their weapons to the ground. Another Arakakra, this one smaller and with black feathers, swoops down, scooping the various axes, daggers and short sword into its arms before awkwardly hopping off the side of the cart. Now unarmed, the party can only watch as the person gently floats down, alighting on the cart. He wears a vest and shorts, but is barefoot, his blue skin speckled with white. His hair floats gently as if held aloft by a gentle wind, and his eyes are light and warm. An air genesy. Hand over your valuables and we'll let you go. The rogue goes to complain but the sorcerer hits him with his tail. The paladin steps forward, immediately getting a glaive pointed at his face from one of the Arakakra. We're not going to give over our things. We're on an important mission that will serve all of Isopin. It would be better to just let us pass. The genesee shakes his head. Don't care. Give us your stuff or we'll start killing you one by one. The paladin gestures to this area, visible now as a distant glowing mound. If we don't stop that, all of Isopin is in danger. The genesee smirks. Well I guess it's a good thing we're not native to Isopin then. He knocks an arrow, not drawing back the string, but keeping it there. It's an extremely cocky action. As if he firmly believes he can draw and shoot faster than the paladin can take a step. The paladin looks at the sky and gets a small smile on his face. You come from the plane of air? The genesee nods. If you can gather that, you know that we do not care if Isopin burns. The paladin nods and talks slowly. But you would care if you were to harm a chosen of genetrix? The Arakacris begin glancing between each other. The air genesee narrows his eyes. The party see his once bright blue skin begin to darken, becoming a stormy grey. You lie. The paladin holds out his arms, exposing his enamored chest. 
Then strike me down where I stand. Prove me wrong. The Genesee raises his bow, drawing the arrow tight on the string. The table is silent and there's so much tension it's pretty much palpable. Finally, the Genesee speaks. You will come with us. We will see if you speak the truth. He releases the tension of the bow and the party let out a collective sigh of relief. The Arakakra point their glaives into his back and begin to walk him off the cart. The rogue jumps off the cart, ripping his crossbow from the black Arakakra's hands and pointing it at the Genesee's head. Ah uh, buddy, you are not just going to take our friend. If he goes, we do too. The Genesee turns to him, flashes of light bursting across his dark body. You will do what we say, or you will die. The paladin suddenly digs his heels in, ignoring the sudden stabs into his back from the glaives. They'll come too, or I will not. The Genesee stares at him for a moment. He looks over at the black feathered Arakakra and says something in Auron. The Arakakra nods and looks up at the sky, emitting a piercing shriek. It repeats the call three more times before stopping, blinking at the party with huge eyes. The party jumps as they hear a deafening shriek. So loud it seems to shake their bones. A great wind rushes up the mountain pass and the party barely keep on their feet. The sun is blocked out as an immense bird swoops down, landing on the mountainside with a resounding crash. OROC. The horses begin to scream in fear, and without a second's hesitation, the cleric unties their restraints. They bolt down the path, not looking back. The Genesee steps into the cart inviting the paladin to step up with him. He looks at the others, who all growl at him. He turns to the rogue. If you want to come along, I suggest you climb aboard now. The rogue grumbles and climbs onto the cart. With two gargantuan taloned feet, the ROC grabs the cart, and with ease, begins to lift it off the ground. The rogue gives a very unseemly shriek and grabs the side of the cart, his eyes going wide. With immense beats of its huge wings, the ROC takes off, soaring higher and higher. The cleric looks over the side of the cart, and seeing the quickly disappearing ground, throws up. The Genesee looks over in disgust, even as the cleric crawls back inside, bundling himself close. They fly higher still, going faster and faster as they gain altitude. The air begins to get frighteningly cold, and the party's heads begin to swim with the lack of oxygen and pure g-forces being enacted on them. The rogue taps himself and casts alter self. I ask what he's doing. I want to increase the hemoglobin in my blood. So his air problem is solved. He taps the paladin and cleric, giving them the same benefit. They thank him. The rogue casts message on the sorcerer. Become an arakakra if you don't want to pass out. The sorcerer nods and twins polymorph, turning he and the fighter into small, feathered humanoids. They keep going higher and higher, until the air genesee leans down to the crouching party. We're about to go through the gate. He yells, barely audible over the wind. Even as he says it, the party feel a cold rush of energy pass through their bodies. The paladin peers over the edge and realizes that all he can see around them is open skies. The only break being distant clouds and a blue tinged gate far below. They've passed into the plane of air. The ROC carries them to one of the clouds, and as it lands, the party surprisingly find it solid. The ROC screeches and flies off. The Genesee steps off the cart, and as the party reluctantly follow, they see an immense collection of buildings. The cleric stumbles a bit before falling to his knees. He vomits a bit more before getting back up. No like. The rogue pats him on the back. The Genesee walks them to the cloud-based village, and as the party look around, they notice that most of the inhabitants are Arakakra, with the occasional wind or storm spirit floating around. One such spirit flies up to the rogue, a constantly shifting wisp of air and cloud. The rogue reaches out to touch it and a small bolt of electricity erupts from it, striking him on the finger. His white hair sticks up on end and he lets out a little yell. The Genesee chuckles and the rogue glares at him, keeping well away from the other spirits. They pass through the village, getting stared at by seemingly every single inhabitant. They walk up to a central building, a dim roof temple of sorts. The pillars, made from some unknown material, are decorated with symbols, depicting winged creatures and fierce lightning storms. 
the party are walk through the temple until finally, they arrive at a set of bronze doors. A wind spirit manifests in front of them, shifting its body until it appears as a cherub. Its eyes, however, spark with lightning, belying its spiritual nature. It holds up its chubby hand, and with a surprisingly deep voice, speaks. What do I want Alabasta? Alabasta gestures to the paladin. Need to see the boss. This one claims he is a chosen of Genetrix. The cherub looking spirit raises an eyebrow and floats forward, its form shifting slightly as it does so. It peers at the paladin for a moment before turning to Alabaster. You know he's still pissed at you, right? He's not going to like it when he sees you. Alabaster frowns. What sort of mood is he in? The cherub chuckles. A good one now, but I reckon seeing you is gonna set him right off. Alabaster swings his hand, catching the cherub across the face with the back of his hand. Just tell him I'm here. The cherub holds his face and glares. He floats back a bit and gestures to the rest of the party. Who are they? Alabaster sighs and gestures to the paladin. Said he wouldn't come unless they did too. The cherub smirks. They look funny. The rogue frowns. So do you, dickhead. The cherub bumbles and splutters and generally acts very flustered. He doesn't seem used to non orans talking back. Alabaster snaps his fingers, emitting a loud boom of thunder. Tell him I'm here. The cherub pokes its tongue out and dissipates into a gust of wind, disappearing between the gaps of the door. After about 5 seconds, they hear a loud, booming voice ring out. Alabaster. The genesee sighs even as the bronze doors swing open. The party step into a large circular room, the walls and floor of which are made from shifting clouds. At the back of the room is an immense throne, sitting atop it is a large, grey-skinned, bald man. Bare-chested and wearing simple white pants, he sits on the throne, eyes flashing with electricity. A huge scimitar rests next to the throne within easy reach of his immense hands. The cherub appears next to the rug and hits him with a tiny bolt of electricity on the back of the neck before giggling and fleeing out of the room in his wind form. The heavy bronze doors close behind him. Eris looks down at the party, huge form staring imposingly down at them. Alabaster. Why are you here? You know I don't like seeing you. Alabaster sighs. Oh Lord Eris, I come to you because this one claims to be a chosen one of the Sky Mother. Aris's eyes flash with lightning and his skin darkens briefly. Does he now? Eris snaps his fingers, and the paladin feels strong winds grasp his body, yanking him forward. The paladin floats gently off the ground and Eris leans forward. You're a chosen of Genetrix, HRM. The paladin nods. I am, oh powerful one. I serve the goddess Genetrix, for she has given me power and my freedom. Eris sighs and waves his hand. Please, just don't try flattery. Do you have any idea how many times I've been called, O oh powerful one, or great one or lord of the skies by mortals? After a few millennia of mortals asking wishes of you, you hear it a lot. So, no flattery. It won't get you anywhere with me. The paladin nods. Eris peers past him, looking at the party. And you dare to demand that your friends come into my home? Just who do you think you are? The paladin shakes his head. I meant no insult by it. I just didn't want to leave them down there while I talk to you. Eris's eyes a lot on the rogue, who gives a little wave. You brought a being of the underdark to my domain? That doesn't seem too intelligent. The rogue shakes his head. I'm not a drow. I'm a goblin. Eris smirks. I beg to differ. He turns back to the paladin. So why has Alabaster brought you here? Alabaster clears his throat. Because he claims to be a chosen of Genetrix. If I'm honest, I don't believe him. Eris glares at him. I don't care what you believe. You're lucky I even let you in here. The paladin coughs. If you want, I'll prove it. Eris raises an eyebrow. Will you now? The paladin nods. I just have a request. The room goes silent. The clouds making up the walls and floor begin to darker and move faster, and the party let out sounds of shock as I tell them that their feet are beginning to sink into the floor, as if it's losing its sturdiness. You make a request of me? Eris growls. 
The paladin slowly nods. We need to get to this area or our homes may be in danger. The djinn pauses. And why should I allow that? Because you're a nice person? Eri stares at him for a long time. The rogue and cleric players begin slowly chanting TPK, TPK, TPK. The silence is broken when Eris lets out a booming laugh. The paladin gives an awkward laugh. You amuse me, lizard. I'll humor you for this. The party breathe a collective sigh of relief. Eris snaps his fingers and the paladin falls to the ground. He gestures to the party. You will serve as witness to your friend's miracle. He will test Genetrix's loyalty, and if he succeeds, I will grant you passage. The party give a mini cheer. The rogue steps forward. Uh, what is the test? Does he just have to do a little bit of magic? Eris grins and snaps his fingers. A thin pole appears in the paladin's hands, a weird piece of canvas stretching from the top to near the middle. It's a hang glider of sorts. The paladin looks at it and frowns. What do I do with this? Eris smiles. Fly. Then the floor falls out from underneath the paladin, casting him into the open skies of the plane of air. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.